Um, I want to tell you a little story. In fact, I'm going to tell you a lot of stories today, but I want to start with this one. Last week, I was um, needed to go to Macy's because I needed to pick up a gift for somebody. And of course, on my way there, I drank a large Diet Coke. So uh, as I find a place to park, and I get out of my car, and I walk way over to the entrance, by then I'm kind of like ready to explode. And I go in, and I say to the woman, where is the bathroom? Now, the bathroom is not just right there. The bathroom is through this department, turn left through this other department, and then go back around to this behind these other people, and there I'll find the bathroom, which I did. It would, they were very good directions. But it occurred to me that if I was somebody from another country here, or if I was in another country, and I needed to go to the bathroom, and she had explained to me, and I didn't know English, or, 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 or I didn't know the other language, I would have been in deep trouble. OK? So imagine, how many of you have traveled outside the United States? And how many of you have traveled to a place where you didn't really know the language? OK, so you have a teeny, teeny, tiny inkling of what it's like for people to come to the United States and not know the language. The other thing I want you to just imagine, and I don't think any of you, maybe some of you have had this experience, but have you ever had to leave your country because of war, because of violence, because of famine? No. And that's, we see many people like that at the Dominican Learning Center. I think I can best describe the center by telling you some stories about the people who go there. Okay? And I want to start with Sergio. Sergio is one of my students. By the way, we call them learners, not students, because um, it's, it's a good educational jargon. But we're putting, we're putting the emphasis on them learning versus us teaching them. Okay? So Sergio came to the United States in, uh, when he was about in seventh grade with his father. He attended school f until about ninth grade, and then he dropped out because he had to go to work. And he has worked ever since. He's in his early 30s now. He has been a waiter at a restaurant, um, and he's, he's very dependable. And so his boss has made him a, basically a crew leader. Now, several years ago, he decided he wanted to be, join the State Highway Patrol. He wanted to get a better job. He thought he wanted to be in law enforcement. But of course, if you don't have a GED, you cannot even apply. So Sergio has come to me to learn how to, to pass the GED. He can speak and read English fairly well, except for he doesn't always understand what he's reading. He, doesn't, he can say the words, but he doesn't know what they mean. And he can't really evaluate material critically. And that is a big thing in the GED test today. He is very close. In fact, um, he's actually going to take the GED in Spanish. You can take the GED in Spanish and French and English, which will help him immensely in terms of just passing it. In fact, I called another teacher, to, another one of our sisters, to help him write his essay in Spanish, because I'm not fluent in Spanish. Now, many people think that immigrants are just a burden on the economy. But in 2015, immigrants contributed $4.4 billion in local, state, and federal taxes. Okay, And undocumented workers, I have had more arguments with people about this, undocumented workers contributed $83.2 million in state and local taxes. So many of them do pay taxes. You know, I started t tutoring Lubna, she's from Morocco, uh, several years ago. She spoke no English. She, her main language was Arabic, which as you can imagine is very different from English. Fortunately, she had studied French, and so she knew um, at least the alphabet. Um, and we spent a lot of time with pictures, pictures and repetition, and, and saying little survival kinds of conversations like, where is the bathroom? You know, or hello, my name is Lubna, and I live at this address, and et cetera. Just starting at the very basics so they can manipulate and move around the system. 
Sadly, she had to drop out when she got a job in a factory. Her husband wanted her to work, so she got a job in a factory. And because she has to take the bus to and from, many of our learners don't have transportation of their own or don't have reliable transportation, um, she could not come to class anymore. So, and unfortunately, while she did to pick up the reading um, and the writing pretty well, what she could never do or was not comfortable doing is speaking, okay? That's the biggest problem. You may be, I think that happens to us too. We can understand what people say, but to have the courage to actually say something ourselves and risk making a mistake is very, very difficult for, for people. At the, at the Learning Center, we have students from 49 different countries. And um, six, going back to my other point, 60% of them are employed, either full or part-time. And of the 40% who are not, most of those are moms raising their kids. So a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of cultures, we don't discriminate versus by their race, their nationality, their religion, nothing. We welcome everybody to the Learning Center. And it makes for some really interesting um, conversations and experiences. Now, SAR is from Liberia. And there was a very bloody civil war which killed over 600,000 people and displaced a million people. All, as you can imagine, when there's war, all education stopped. All cultural things stop when there's a war. And so he stopped going to school when he was 12. I'm not so sure how much school he how much he got out of school before age 12, but he stopped. And then he and his mom traveled to um, various countries to refugee camps, and he, he came to the United States when he was 33. His father was here, and so when he came, he was able to work for his father in his home health business. Now, Sar is determined to get a GED. However, his reading level and his math level are um, at Pre, at not preschool, but elementary school level. He was at our very beginning books. And while he proceeded very, quite quickly to get through them, uh, recently something has kind of thrown a, a wrench into that. He got married, which is a good thing. But his wife had a baby. And so now he not only has the issues of working, because he works full time, but now he has a family he has to take care of too. And many, many, many of our learners are, uh, have families, many have children, um, and so they have that issue of dealing with their families and family situations as well as coming to school. Um, all of our learners, we have learners who have never been to school, and we have learners who have PhDs. So we get people in business, we get people from Ohio State who want to improve their language. And we do one-to-one -one tutoring. So what that allows us to do is um, to adjust our teaching directly to what the learner needs, okay? Which really helps when you have big holes in your education. And what we find is that Many of our learners have gone to other places, and there are other places where you can get work on your GED or work on ESL, but they're classes. And so they'll go to the classes, they won't be able to keep up, they'll drop out, and then they usually hear about us where we match them up with a tutor, and then we can work directly with the needs that they have. Now, I'd also like to tell you about Stephanie. Now, Stephanie has just been with us for a short time. She's been clean and sober for about four years after her son died of an overdose, okay? Before that, she spent a lot of time on the street, okay? And um, she was homeless for several, several years, but with the help of, a, of an organization called Amethyst, which is a program for women who have substance abuse, she found the Dominican Learning Center. Interestingly enough, Stephanie is a marvelous writer. She, she writes from her heart. She does a great job, but she's not a good reader. So she's at the lowest level with reading, proceeding quickly, but not, we're gonna focus on her writing, okay, and, and get that out so that people can see and she can have a sense of, of um, confidence and pride in what she's doing. Many of our students su suffer with substance abuse. 
um, either that or mental illness. And I don't know if you probably know this statistic, but one in five children have some type of mental illness. And of those children, 50% drop out of high school. And I don't know if you know this statistic, but of those people incarcerated, not that just because you have mental illness you're incarcerated, not, but 90% of those do not have a high school diploma. So there are direct correlations, we know this, between education and um, um, success in the world. Now Stephanie has a wonderful energetic tutor. I love Anne, and she has lots of wonderful ideas to work with her. They clicked right away. We have over 180 tutors. Most of them work with students in libraries all around the city. There are currently seven Dominican sisters who work on the staff and a few others who also tutor. And the congregation, we don't take any money from the government at the Learning Center. We do it all through donations and grants and things like that. But the congregation supports the center by essentially donating our salaries of the sisters who work there. And they are committed to keeping us alive for longer than 20 years. We've been around for over 20 years. Um, and the congregation is committed to keeping us going because there's a really great need. 20% of the people in the United States are functionally illiterate. That's a lot of people who can't read beyond the fourth grade level. Okay, so it's so important. We do ask our learners to pay a $35 learner fee. So they have some skin in the game. Now, if they can't pay, we would never ever turn anybody away. We give scholarships. But sometimes we say, can you just pay a little bit every month? And it has not been an issue at all with people, with them contributing. Now one of the myths about immigrants is that they come over and take the jobs that Americans would have, okay? But let me tell you about Adama. Adama is from the Ivory Coast. He was an engineer and a businessman. But in 2002, there was another civil war pitting the North, which was Islamic, and the South. And Adama lost his business and he was put into jail because he actually lived in the north, okay? So he escaped, he went to Senegal, and then finally came to the United States where he asked for asylum. Originally, the way he got to the Learning Center is he, he actually can, he speaks about four or five different languages, and he could speak English, not great, but not bad. So he brought his wife to learn, and he was waiting for his wife while she was taking her classes, and finally somebody said, well, don't you want to take lessons? Oh, no, no, I'm here for my wife. He goes, well, while you're, while you're here. And they said, he said, well, yeah, okay. If, while she's here, I'll have a, a, um, lessons too. So we started, that was five years ago, matched him up with the tutor, the same tutor he still has. Sadly, his wife died um, just a few years after she started. But, you know, when you think about, um, when you think about the job he has, he now makes glasses at, Exotica, you know, they make glasses. So, you know, here's an educated engineer, and he's basically, a, a, you know, a manual laborer now. So he is, um, by the way, he has eight kids, and they all are either have graduated from college or are in college. So they work hard. Many of our learners, immigrants, they want better for their children. I see this a lot in our moms, our generational poverty moms, who come and they're trying to get their GED. They desperately want their children to graduate from high school. I am telling you, it is 100 times easier to graduate from high school than it is to get a GED. It is extremely difficult to get a GED. Thomas just graduated from our success course. He's in his 50s. And um, our success course is a four-week orientation program to help our GED um, students who are mostly come from generational poverty. And so they, they're, the chaos in their lives is unbelievable. And as I mentioned, you know, everything gets in the way of education. Education's important, but if your kid is sick, if you are sick, if somebody's in jail, if you're going to court for um, some kind of um, anything, you know, or here's the thing that's happening now. There are actually a lot of jobs in Columbus right now. A lot of jobs for manual laborers. But there aren't a lot of workers right now. 
So if you have a job and somebody doesn't show up, guess what? You have to stay or you have to come in. And so the day that you are supposed to come in for class, you got to work. You can't turn down a double shift or an opportunity to come in. So right now, what we've been struggling with is getting people coming regularly to, to continue their education. Thomas grew up in the South. Oh, by the way, the success course is designed to help them orient themselves back to school. So we have study schools, time, or study skills, time management. Um, we talk about mindset. You probably are familiar with the concept of mindset. We talk about expectations. So they know what they're getting themselves into before they come. So Thomas told me that he was there because he wanted to learn how to spell. He wanted to be able to write a letter that was longer than, hello, how are you? He grew, he grew up in the South, and he never, he, up till fifth grade, he didn't learn how to read or write. He moved to the Bronx in New York City. He was there till eighth grade. He had some more help, but never really learned how to read or write. Moved to Columbus. Now, this is interesting, because Thomas is a welder. He's a photographer. But he can't write a letter. And that's what he wants to do. So Thomas has missed two classes now because of work, because he couldn't get off from work. But he's going to keep coming. I keep bugging him, and he's going to be coming. And he's got great tutors as well. Sometimes we ask our students to not, we never kick anybody out. But we say to them, if they've missed three classes, we say, you know, maybe this is not the best time for you to be here. Why don't you step out? We call it stepping out. Why don't you step out for a while? And when things calm down, just give me a call, and you can come back. And we can't always guarantee they'll have the same tutor, but we'll, we'll get them back in the program. And we have people who come back two, three, four, five times You know, over the years. We had one woman, it took her 14 years to get her GED. But you, know, you give them credit for staying with the program. Now, I'd like to finish up with um, another a final learner. Her name is Martha. And Martha is 76 years old. She never went to school. Her parents died when she was small. And her foster parents did not have the resources to help her. She has some learning disabilities. Three years ago, she decided she wanted to learn to read. So they heard about her caseworker, heard about our program. She lives independently, by the way. And um, she came, and we had her with another tutor, and they got a little bit of the way. Um, but then last year, we matched her up with Sister Sean Fitzpatrick, who had been the director and is now working with our very lowest levels. Some of you know her. And Sean, she, uh, Martha and Sean, or Martha, read 10 kindergarten level books last year and is on track to read 10 more this year. And she's doing math. OK? And we love when Mar Martha comes on Wednesday afternoon. So when I'm done here, I have to go back, because this is Martha's day. And when Martha's there, <laughs> OK, Martha comes and she reads the books to us. And it's a joy to see her face light up when she can read these books. You know, they are very simple books, but it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter to us what level a person is, OK, or what country they come from, or what religion they are, because we can help them. And Several years ago, we started a, a partnership with Christ the King Parish, some of you that's over on Livingston Avenue. And we call it a parish partnership. And what we do is this. They provide the facility, they provide the tutors, and they provide the learners. Now, the program is focused primarily on Latino people as a part of a grant we have to reduce violence in Latino neighborhoods. And what we do, which is what our strength is, we train the tutors, we provide oversight of the program, and we provide the materials, which we get through grants. 
And really, it's a win-win-win. It's a win for us. It's a win for the parish actually four wins. It's a win for the tutors and a win for the learners. And it's a way for the parishes to bring their parishioners together. So last year we started at St. Agnes, St. Mary Magdalene, which is over on the west side. And this year we're starting up with St. Peter's, which is on the north side. All of these have pockets of Latinos. And what we're hoping to do is eventually expand it to other parishes that have other um, communities of immigrants in their, in their churches, in their parishes. So that's the kind of things that we do at the Learning Center. And um, it's been a real eye-opener for me. I always taught in more affluent schools. So to learn about the stories of folks that are trying to escape from civil war, you know, who are trying to keep their bread on the table and keep their car running and all the stuff they have to do. Excuse me. It's been a real uh, pleasure and a treat for me to be there. Do you have any questions? I know we only have, a, we have about nine minutes left. Yes? The typically they find out about you or your services? The uh, learners, word of mouth either word of mouth or through agencies. So we've had relationships off and on with different places that do substance abuse, so Salvation Army where they do human trafficking, um, other places where they do help people in that way. It's mostly where we don't advertise. Now for tutors, we do advertise in parish bulletins mostly. That's where you'll read about us. Um, or we have, I have some flyers if anybody would like a flyer. Um, or other people tell others that they do it and it's a great thing to do. What we ask our tutors to, to donate is um, two hours a week, of an hour and a half to two hours a week of um, tutoring and then being prepared because you only have that short amount of time. We do have a lot of digital resources to help in the off times or for other things to help, um, help people move faster because it can get super frustrating, you know, for people. So, yes. You mentioned that you were grant funded, and I'm wondering what kind of foundations are you getting money? Um, we got a huge grant from CHI, Catholic Health in Initiative, that's doing this Latino v violence issue. Um, education places, so we, ha um, Dollar General actually provided us with um, about $7,500. They are big in literacy, Dollar General is. I mean, now I buy a lot of stuff at Dollar General, but um, so um, Pro Literacy, which is the big uh, literacy organization, they have a book fund that you can get money from. The Marion Foundation, which supports Catholic things here, the Seymour Foundation. Um, we're always going after other people that are involved, want to improve the community, uh, mostly through adult education. So we're we, we're trying to jump into some other ones that we haven't made it, like Ingram, they do stuff like that, and Donato's, we haven't got there. Uh, we apply for them every year. Yeah, we get money from the congregation, the Shalom Fund as well. And we're involved in the Big Give. Uh, oh, I knew I missed something. Shoot, and we're give, but not. You can always pitch in. Giving Tuesday is going to be coming up in November, so um, you could do that. And and we do it. We do an annual fund. Um, we do with several newsletters out there with the envelope and stuff like that. So. Um, they, it's interesting, they help us specifically with our parish partnerships. They have a big fund that goes towards parish stuff and a small fund that goes towards other things. So if we can um, t partner up with a parish, we are more likely to get some money for that. So, yeah. Barb may be interested, I think, in the ODU connection with Sister Marie. Sister Marie, yeah, Sister Marie Granger was the one who started it. You know, the Dominican sisters, um, of St. Mary of the Springs, who we were before we became peace, or primarily in education, not all. Some of us were in hospital ministry, but the majority of us were in education. And so um, about over about 20 years ago, they realized that there was a, a, a group of people who needed to be educated outside of the Catholic schools, all right? And so they started to do some focus work 
to find out if there were adults that needed help with literacy. It was not ESL at that point, but literacy. And um, they discerned that there was a need, and so they uh, found a location over at Christ the King, that's where we're located, and they um, started with one learner and six sisters. Talk about a good student-teacher ratio, right? <laughs> right. And then um, uh, after a few years, they decided that um, um, they wanted to move into English as a second language, started doing that. And now, after 20 years, we're um, about 270-ish people um, in the program, mostly ESL now. About 80%, 75% is ESL, 25% is um, GED. And um, we've had, I'm the third director after Sister Marie. It was Sister Sean Fitzpatrick and then myself. So if anybody is interested in becoming a director, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Anything else? Yes. Okay. okay. In in education, right? Yeah. People don't know that you came from Dominican Academy in New York. I was. I got to follow Sister Joan for, uh, as the principal at Dominican Academy. And so so the the thing that's been interesting for me is you go to, from a place like Dominican Academy, which is um, the kids are all and the upper 20% of their class. And so they're expected to be there. They're expected to graduate from high school. They're expect, it's just, it's what, what you do. To a place where <laughs> people are coming to us without a diploma, you know, who dropped out in ninth grade, who can't read and write. I mean, it is like, woo -hoo. It's been It's been a very big challenge for me to adjust. And, and one time I said to Sister Sean, I was really frustrated, I said, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with people not coming? She said, we help the people who are here. And every time, like this morning, when my learner didn't come and some other people didn't, I was like, we help the people who are here. <laughs> you know, I mean, because when you're working with people in poverty, it's all you can do. You, you can't make, you don't have expectations about how quickly you're going to get stuff done and all of that. So it's, it's challenging, but it's also rewarding. Jim has been a tutor for us. As, as I said, he's taking a sabbatical, hopefully not very long. Um, but, you know, so it's been a wonderful, um, interesting experience. Anything else? I think we're almost done. One more minute. Well, it's wonderful to have you and just think you're helping the people that are here. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Thank you.